Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start out with this opening statement. Ready? Here we go. I'm Frank Ford. I was previously introduced, but I couldn't see you because of the column, and you probably didn't see me either. I represent Cindy Young, who's the lady sitting at the council table. There is a difference from what you just heard from plaintiff's counsel and what you'll hear from me, and that difference is this. Ms. Young cannot say anything to you about why Mr. Urban, the plaintiff, this gentleman here, suddenly came into her lane. She cannot give you any explanation for that. Mr. Urban is the gentleman who will have to tell you what happened. All Ms. Young can tell you, and it's very simple, is that she was driving along, approaching Leonard Town Road. She's in the extreme left lane. For those of you who are familiar with this intersection, there are two left turn lanes that go up to Leonard Town Road. She's in the extreme left lane when all of a sudden, out of the blue, Mr. Urban jumps into her lane right in front of her. She's going at a speed of about 35 to 40 miles per hour, minding her own business when this sudden emergency arises in front of her. Mr. Irvin himself will tell you he did just that. Now, he has an explanation, but Ms. Young can't give you that explanation. All she can tell you is that for whatever reason, Mr. Irvin jumped into her lane. She hit her brakes, but she was unable to avoid hitting him. That's her sole role in this case. This is a motor negligence case. In order for the plaintiff to prevail against my client, Ms. Young, he must establish to your satisfaction that she did something wrong, that she was negligent. We think you'll be satisfied after you hear from Mr. Irvin, Ms. Young, and the driver for Baltimore Tank Lines that Ms. Young did not do anything wrong. She was as much a victim in this accident as anyone when Mr. Irvin jumped into her lane. And let me tell you a little bit about my client. She's married. She has three children. She lives in Charlotte Hill. Her husband is retired military, and she had taken her young daughter, the youngest of their three children, Krista, who was then about age six, up to Andrews Air Force Base to be checked out. She had an ear infection, and they go to Andrews for their medical needs. They were coming home when this accident occurred. That's why she was on the road. She was familiar with this road, and she will tell you that she had been in that extreme left lane from the time it started up, and before that had been in the left lane, lane all the way from 301 down Mattawoman Beantown Road to where this accident happened. a short one, a short opening, opening statement. Now we'll try some jury charge. Ready? Here we go. <clears throat> The arguments of the attorneys are not evidence of damages. Your award must be based on your reasoned judgment applied to the testimony of the witnesses and the other evidence that has been admitted during trial. You must not consider or include as part of any award attorney fees or expenses that the parties incurred in bringing or defending this lawsuit. Ms. Guyon cannot recover any damages for any conduct that occurred outside the statute of limitations period. 
Accordingly, Ms. Gullion cannot recover damages for conduct that occurred prior to May 27, 2008. Plaintiff cannot recover for any alleged emotional distress resulting from her filing this lawsuit and participating in the litigation process. The plaintiff cannot recover damages for any emotional distress that was not caused by the defendants. The purpose of the court's instructions is to instruct you as to the applicable law so that you may arrive at a just and lawful verdict. Whether some instructions will apply will depend upon what you find to be the facts. Even though I have instructed you on various subjects, including damages, you must not treat the instructions as indicating the court's opinion on how you should decide any issues in this case or as to which party is entitled to your verdict. I will give you verdict forms with questions you must answer. I have already instructed you on the law that you are to use in answering these questions. You must follow my instructions and the forms carefully. You must consider each question separately. Although you may discuss the evidence and the issues to be decided in any order, you must answer the questions on the verdict forms in the order they appear. After you answer a question, the form tells you what to do next. All 12 of you must deliberate on and answer each question. At least nine of you must agree on an answer before all of you can move on to the next question. However, the same nine or more people do not have to agree on each answer. When you have finished filling out the forms, your presiding juror must write the date and sign it at the bottom of the last page and then notify the bailiff that you are ready to present your verdict in the courtroom. Right. That is the end of that jury charge. See what we have for some literary practice. This is one that we had started before. It's called Tips for Going Green. And these are tips from NCRA members. Ready? Here we go. Margot Lucas, a cart captioner in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, gets documents about the city's e-cycling program with her property tax bill. Her local library has bags for a waste management company for used ink cartridges that the Postal Service picks up from residential mailboxes. The Postal Service will also take cell phones, but Lucas said, I prefer to donate cell phones to our local domestic shelter. In my family, when an old computer PC has spent a few years in the basement and we decide we can get rid of it, we take out the hard drive, smash it with a hammer, and take everything to the recycling center, including the power cord, keyboard, etc., said Patricia Schneider, RDR, CRR, a freelancer in Louisville, Kentucky. If your town doesn't have a resource for recycling electronics, another one nearby might instead. Teresa Alexander, RMR, CRR, an official, in Buellton, Texas, takes advantage of a neighboring town's recycling day where they will accept certain items at certain locations from old tires at one location to any electronics and old TVs at another location to used oil at another. 
turning off electronics and lights. A few members mentioned that during off turning off electronics and especially lights has become a habit. My family and friends tease me about how I can't walk out of a room or even walk by a room with lights on and not flip the switch off, said Michelle Gustason, RPRCRR, a freelancer in Indianapolis, Indiana. For those interested in developing the habit, however, some members did provide a few tips. I do have sticky notes on my desk in my office reminding me to plug or unplug computers or at least set them on energy saving mode and the same thing with the lights in my office, said Christine Johnson, RMR, a freelancer in Phoenix, Arizona. Melissa Marenberg, RPR, a freelancer in Bradley, Maine, said, I just double and triple check the lights and electronics until I'm sure. Our offices are equipped with sensors to turn the lights off after 10 minutes, cutting down on usage, and our thermostats are set to a limiting range as well, said Janet Davis, RDR, CRR, an official in Cheyenne, Wyoming. For smaller electronics like laptops, Jeanette Visier, RPR, a freelancer in Cameron Park, California, said, I ask myself if I plan to use it within the next couple of hours. If not, then I turn it off. Unplugging small electronics is also a popular tip. One way i found that's easy for me to do that is to actually store the appliance, like my toaster and blender, off the counter. So when I'm finished using the appliance, I unplug it and put it back where it belongs, says Marie Schultz, an official in St. Paul, Minnesota. Also, when I'm charging an electronic device, such as my laptop's cell phone or Kindle, I take the electronic off the charger when the battery is at 100% or close to. I also unplug and store my chargers when I'm not using them. At the end of my workday, as long as the device is not in need of a charge, I pull the plug from the wall or switch off the power strip, which is sometimes easier than pulling a plug. As long as my Steno machine has a charge, I am sure to unplug that as well. I also pull the power plug on my computers. This also helps in case of a storm. I can ensure I'm not getting any power surges into my equipment, says Kim Fagiani, RMR, a captioner in Warren, Ohio. I do not turn off things such as my router or cable box, for instance. The time it might take to reboot is something that isn't good for my remote work, she added. Jennifer Church, RPR, a freelancer in Phoenix, Arizona, recommended avoiding lights when possible. If I can open the blinds to let the sun in, then I don't need to turn the lights on, she said. And Tonya, Tonya Kaiser, RPR, CMRS, a freelancer in Fort Wayne, Indiana, pointed out, I don't really think of it as going green as much as not paying for electricity for things we're not using. our opening statement. Actually, sorry. We are done with our opening statement. This is the closing argument. Sorry about that. Ready? Here we go. Now, what's more likely than not, I think Mr. Irvin's version 
is more likely than not he's a gentleman who's on his way home to get ready for work something comes into his lane he immediately goes in the opposite direction and then right at the scene the first thing that he says to the only other person that was right there and that stopped is did you see that truck you know he didn't sit and think of how the accident happened he didn't sit there for 20 minutes and try to come up with a reason he said exactly what had just happened to him moments before you know it's the one thing that Ms. Young clearly remembers about this accident is, is that Mr. Irvin said that immediately afterwards. Now, Mr. Quaid, he can't tell you for sure what, if anything, he did, or what Mr. Irvin or Ms. Young did. He has nothing to say about this accident other than he hopes you'll believe that he didn't do anything but he hasn't offered any proof of it, and the only proof as to what the actions of this trailer was are Mr. Irvin's story of how it happened and the comment that he made right afterwards to somebody who's also a defendant in the case. Ms. Young doesn't have any reason to say that that's what Mr. Irvin said unless he said it. She has nothing to gain by supporting his version of the events in that respect. So I, I would submit to you that what she said that he said to her is very, very reliable because she has no reason to make it up. It happened right after the accident. She was also very clear that that's what Mr. Urban said. And again, there's been some discussion about what you actually have to do physically with your vehicle as you go through here. Mr. Mr. Quaid's trying to say that you can just continue with from here, that you just continue with your vehicle in a straight line, and that as long as you don't do anything, you somehow will end up in this lane. But I think the diagram that everybody has agreed is an accurate representation of the road doesn't support that. As you can see, you know, if you if you're going to if you're going to get into one of these turn lanes, you've got to cross that dividing line. You've got to go from a through lane into a turn lane. And the instructions the court just gave you say that when you have to do that you can change lanes here when it's safe to do so you gotta make sure it's safe to do so before you do it and that's more likely than not what happened in this accident is that the driver of the Baltimore tank lines vehicle didn't exercise due care how we know they didn't exercise due care is because the driver didn't make sure that that turn lane was clear of vehicles before he got into it. And Mr. Irvin testified that as soon as he was able, he got into this clear lane and continued on. And that had that vehicle not come over into his lane, he would have gone up to the light made his turn and gone home. And that's the long and short of what happened here. I think that it's common knowledge that nobody has exact recall of anything, particularly something that happened two years ago. But what's material, what's important, the important parts all make sense because if a tractor trailer didn't come into Mr. Urban's lane, why would he jump over into the next lane? He'd have no reason to do that, and if he was going to get into that lane, he would be in the wrong place because he has to make a right after he makes this turn. So Mr. Urban's got no reason to ever be in this leftmost lane unless something forces him into it, which 
would be the truck that Ms. Young didn't see before the accident, but when Mr. Urban pointed it out to her at the light, she saw it and she admitted that too. So we know that a Baltimore Tank Lions vehicle was there. We know that it came into Mr. Urban's lane and we know that that caused the accident. I'd submit to you that that's what more likely than not. And I'd ask you when you fill out that verdict sheet that it should say, it should say that Baltimore Tank Lines was negligent and that Baltimore Tank Lines negligence was a, a cause of this accident. All right, and that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.